I'm George Dunlap, and I, I was the community, the um, release coordinator for Zen 4.3 and 4.5, so I'm going to be giving um, uh, just a brief intro to the, huh? Sorry, 4.3, 4.4, yes. So I'm going to be giving a, a brief overview of Zen development practices, and then a bit of a 4.4 retrospective, and then I'm going to hand off to Conrad, who is uh, taking over the release coordination for uh, 4.5. So. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to remind kind of everybody we have some sort of new uh, users here that um, just I think people who've been in the project for a while we know that it's an open source project it's not controlled by one vendor but I think a lot of people outside that community aren't really necessarily aware of that um, so Zen is and always has been a community uh, developed project um, so one of the things about open source uh, which is you know I think there's a lot of advantage of open source over proprietary but one of the advantages is that um, whenever you start using something, whenever you start contributing to a project in some way, you base your infrastructure on it, there's a risk that the project will move in a direction that doesn't really match your future needs, right? So you may, um, you know, put your stuff on some piece of soft proprietary software, and then if the company decides they actually want to go somewhere else in a different place, um, you don't really have any say, you're just, just kind of stuck, you have to move to a different thing. Um, so whenever you, you decide to, to that's particularly the case if you decide to contribute to a project, um, in the open source project. So one of the things that we want to be able to do um, when you're building an open source project, if you want it to be community developed, um, like Zen is, then you have to build trust. So people have to be able to trust that um, if they contribute to the project, if they base their thing on it, that they're going to be able to have influence over the direction of the project. Um, and so a couple of things that we try to do when we're doing the development, um, we try to be a technical meritocracy. So no matter who you are, if you have the best technical idea, um, we want your stuff to be to, to be in. Um, if you can make a good case for why you think this is the the, the, the right way to go, then um, you know we, we'll try and listen to you. Um, we want as much as possible all important decisions to be made in the open, so that anyone who is just on the list and paying attention and listening and coming to these events can have an input in them and say, actually, I don't think that's a, a good way to go. I think we should do this because this would help me best. Um, and uh, so you have the opportunity to see where things are going, and I have an opportunity to influence the direction. Um, and in generally, want to be the case that the more the more you contribute, the more influence you can have. Now, um, in, in many cases, people can come and say, "Well, actually, I need this functionality," and accommodating that functionality doesn't have any cost to anybody else, right? So in that case, well, we'll just have, sure, why not, toss it in, right? But in some cases, that there's, there's kind of a tension, right, between, well, if we, if we go this direction, it, it, it makes it harder to go the other direction as well, or there's an extra cost, right? Um, so in that case, um, if you contribute more to the Zen project, um, we want you to be able to have, we, 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 I mean, as a community, we will try to weigh your needs heavier when we're, when we're trying to do trade-offs. If there's no trade-off, then of course, you know, there's no reason not to have both things. But there, if there is a trade-off, then we want to have the people who contribute more um, in terms of code or in terms of support or things like that um, to have um, more influence. Now, obviously, I mean, we're, we're only human beings, um, and so we're not perfect, uh, but this is our kind of our goal. And if you see something, um, so one of the things that's kind of against that is, and also to remind to developers here, is kind of decisions made kind of in the back doors, not in the open. Sometimes you need to have face-to-face -face discuss discussion. Sometimes you need to have things off list. But as much as possible, um, all the things should be open as, as possible. And if you, as someone outside, feel like there's kind of an in group and you're not sort of, um, that you, you can't be a part of and you're not being able to have the influence that you, you think you should have, then call us out on it um, and let us know. OK, so on to the 4.4 development. Um, so the development window opened in July 2013. Our goal this time was to have a six-month release cycle, which was shorter than the, the nine-month and shorter yet than the one-and-a-half-year, 18-month uh, that it has been previously. So our scheduled release was January. We actually released in the beginning of March. Uh, so I think that's okay if you're counting Christmas in there. It's about, about seven months of development time. Um, just a couple highlights. Um, as Zen uh, as um, Laura's mentioned, uh, this is one of the, the best tested uh, releases that we've, we've ever had. So um, OSS test, which is our um, community uh, uh, testing gateway, was open sourced, sort of opened up and made so that you could, any pub, the public could contribute to it uh, about a year ago. 
And over the course, um, it is more than two people, probably at least five or six people have contributed to that um, and made that a lot better. Um, additionally, the Zen server team, so Zen server, of course, has their internal um, regression testing system. And the Zen, uh, it's called Zen RT. And the Zen server team has um, made it so it's much easier for them to take a development snapshot, put it into, make a build of Zen server with that development snapshot, and then run it through Zen RT. Um, and so that team was able to um, do that several more, uh, um, do that several times during the, the the sort of code freeze and the release process. And so the result is that this is the best tested and sort of most reliable um, release we've, we've we've had yet, and it's only going to get better. Um, other core things in include um, event channel scalability, so uh, the work that David Vrabel did. Um, so now instead of having a limit of a few thousand event channels, you have a limit of tens of thousands of event channels. Um, so that limitation for how many guests you can create has been uh, effectively removed. Um, we have, uh, so the LibXL sort of device script daemon when you're setting up um, uh, devices. Uh, has been made, rather than using sort of UDEV and a couple of kind of different scripts, it's been made consistent across all, um, whether you're in a, a driver domain or whether you're in a, the DOM0 or where, whether you're running Linux or FreeBSD as your, as your driver domain. Um, so that's consistent across all the things, and that's uh, uh, much more, uh, yeah, consistent. Um, other highlights for x86, we have the experimental support for PVH. DOMU, um, and as hopefully you've picked up from the previous Zen summits, we're hoping PVH is going to be sort of the way forward um, uh, for Zen as a mix of PV and, and the hardware support. Um, nested virtualization, the guys at Intel um, have been doing a lot of work on improving the functionality of nested virtualization. Um, and we moved that from sort of experimental into tech preview. Um, so, and I've used actually nested virtualization for a lot of my testing um, now. So if I want to test, you know, Ubuntu or CentOS, the Zen thing. Rather than installing CentOS on a VM, I can install CentOS in a VM and then run a VM in the VM on, on, on CentOS. Mm -hmm. And it works, um, it's actually, it's really convenient. And um, the Intel guys are doing a lot of testing on it. Now there's, we call it tech preview because there's still a handful of cases where it's not ready for production yet. Because um, uh, there's a handful of cases where an attacker could um, induce uh, basically a denial of service on, on the host. So it's not ready to, to sort of give to, you know, if, if you're a hosting provider, it's not ready to give to the, the, the public yet. But if you're using it internally, um, then, uh, then it's, it's ready to sort of use and, and, and test um, and, and report bugs. Expect things to work, um, and if they don't work, then report them to the list, and we'll try and, um, the, the Intel guys are really keen to get that um, uh, working. Um, another just thing about uh, sort of success story from the uh, community development point of view is uh, SPICE support for HVM guests. So SPICE is, um, is a protocol like uh, VNC for that Red Hat has developed and put into QMU. Um, and the main thing that we need for, to get that working for um, in Zen is just um, working out a lot of the, the kinks and doing the plumbing to get the uh, Zen tool stack to enable that in QMU. Um, and there was, we had a really motivated uh, user, a guy named uh, Fabio Fantoni, who I, I think he's a technical sort of sysadmin, um, who he wanted that functionality himself, and we sort of worked with him to actually allow that to, to, to have him implement that for us. So um, ARM, lots of really, I mean, lots of stuff going on in ARM. So 4.4 was the first one that had this, the stable ABI declared. So if you have a, any kind of a, an operating system that runs on Zen 4.4 in ARM, then we will try to make sure that that continues to work for you in, in the indefinite future if you're uh, adhering to the, um, the 4.4 ABI. Um, yeah, lots of new features, lots of new platforms supported. Really good stuff there. Um, Linux, we had uh, big things include um, indirect descriptors for PV block devices. Uh, that allows you to have a much larger number of in-flight requests at the same time, mm -hmm. which allows us to take advantage of a lot higher throughput, uh, aggregate throughput, with things like um, SSDs and um, RAID arrays. Um, KExec has been improved. Uh, KExec is primarily used um, for uh, collecting data after, after a system crash. Um, and there's a bunch of cool stuff working on in um, uh, external projects. So uh, one of the big things is libvirt support for libxl. So the um, Jim Felg in particular and a lot of the guys at SUSE have been working on this for a while now. And it was really in 4.4, I think, that time frame 
that uh, the Libvirt support for LibXL was at a state where we could say, okay, now you can actually use it. You can use this in production. There's a, still, at this point, um, during 4.4, there were still a lot of pieces missing. So at that point, we didn't have migration. We didn't have PCI pass-through. But um, the basic things that you use for sort of cloud orchestration um, were, were, were there and stable and, and, and usable. Um, another really cool thing, an external project, is PVGrub2. So as, as many as you um, know, uh, uh, so we've had PVGrub for some time in, in Zen. And essentially what that is is porting Grub1 um, to into MiniOS to run in a, uh, in a PV mode. So what you can do is you can start a PVGrub image, and that PVGrub image will then and hand it the disk, and that pvgrub image will look at your disk, find the, the grub config file, load the kernel for it, presents you a menu, uh, load the, the kernel for you, and then um, k-exec into the kernel um, and allow you to boot. But um, most of the distros now have all moved to grub2, um, and maintaining this sort of a, of, of a thing of sort of porting uh, grub onto running inside of miniOS was sort of a big hassle. Well, what someone did is, um, uh, again, a community member did, is they went to the Grub team and they, um, they added PV support to upstream Grub. So upstream Grub can now talk to Zen through the, the interfaces and stuff like that. It has PV device support. Um, and, so, and, and now it has a thing where you can, the, the build for PV Grub, for Grub 2, you can build an image which is then bootable on um, Zen PV. So this, these things haven't kind of trickled down to the distributions yet. But once they do, then um, we'll have the really binary compatibility for all Grub2 things um, going forward. All right, so that's some exciting things going on that have happened in 4.4. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Conrad and hand over my least coordinator jacket. <laughs> we'll talk about 4.5. All right, thank you. <laughs> now I feel like a proper release manager. <laughs> <clears throat> of course it fits. <laughs> it's just right. Okay, let's try this. So uh, let's move that to the QA of my session. Sure. You okay with that? All right. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so uh, let me start. I think uh, after me is David. He's going to talk about the Linux part. So um, first off, my name is Conrad. I work for Oracle. I'm a software development manager. And the curious thing about Oracle is that if even if you're a manager and a software development, you still have to code. So I've been coding and coding. Uh, in the past, I used to be. <laughs> A Linux um, Zen subsystem maintainer, so I used to maintain with Jeremy Fitzheigerner, Fitzherdinger. I used to maintain the Zen subsystem Linux, and now I've kind of passed it on to David Rubel and Boris Ostrowski, who's not here. And they're focusing on that, and I'm focusing on more adding stuff in Zen and working on that. Um, the agenda, there's not much time we have, so I'm going to just skip on some of the slides. Um, and if you have questions, just ask me afterwards. As George mentioned, there are a lot of things that we're adding during this whole process of doing a release management. And what we decided to do is, well, let's try a new thing. Let's try to take uh, the next version of Zen 4.5 and let's make all that happen and shift it to somebody else. So to see how this process works and whether we can make this happen so that we can kind of have a moving it around so that it's not everybody who's the release manager is every release and people can relax a bit like he is doing, other people wear the jackets and so forth. Um, the George mentioned about the couple of different tests framework that we use. So the OSST, the Zen RT. Um, internally, the Linux Zen subsystem maintainer, so David and Boris use something called XTT, which tests against test Linux against different versions of Zen to see if there are any regressions that Linux has. It's splendid during merge windows when stuff just happens to pull in and there are regressions everywhere you have to fix them by the time release comes out it's beautiful and works great under Zen. So that's been really useful. 
For Zen 4.5, one of the things that I wanted to do is add performance metrics. We use Zen on large machines. Imagine a eight socket machines with six terabytes of memory and thousands of guests, and they all have to run perfectly fast. So we wanted to add a metric of performance to make sure that all these patches that go in won't slow down Zen. Um, and the other part is just try to see it as a non-Citrix employee to see if the communication and all that process will work. There are some tough choices the release manager has to do when it comes to the feature free state. George hasn't mentioned it, but he was pretty tired. He had to say to some people who had these patches, great patches, they were just almost ready. He said, no, I'm sorry. This might introduce a bug. So we have to next time. So one of the things that we wanted to do for Zen 4.5 is make it nine months. That's from when Zen 4.3 was released till this is released. We decided December 10th is the perfect time for it to come out right there as a Christmas present. And you can test it as you see fit. But we would start actually cutting off features and saying, no more features. Now on, let's do bug fixes. Though some features might go and trickle through if they're in a pretty good shape. And the people that review say, you know what? There are some bugs, but we can get them through the next three, three months. So September 10th, which is you know two or three weeks away from now, is when we feature freeze, no more, no more features. Now we focus on bug fixing and making this whole release as awesome as we can. Now, as George alluded and as Lars alluded, there is a lot of other things that are related in the Zen ecosystem, for the lack of word. There's a hypervisor, there's a tool stack, there are the guests that take advantage of it. There are the libraries like Libvirt. Um, there is also Grub2, a bootloader, and so forth. There's a whole bunch of things that happen to make this work. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lot of pieces. What I'm going to focus on is I'm going to try, try to go through all of those pieces and as fast as possible and uh, without losing a lot of focus. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to focus first on the hypervisor, and then I'm going to go down to the tool stack, then the operating systems, and then we can talk about some other pieces. So one of the neat things that happened with Zen and ARM, actually, one of the neat things that happened in ARM is that the whole universe, the way it was created, is designed specifically for a type 1 hypervisor like Zen. It, they just made it just right. I mean, it, it's, it has the right types. It's, it's perfectly suited for Zen. So we've been focusing on that, and there's been a lot of development done into it. Um, and the interesting thing about the ARM ecosystem is that they're very different from the x86, which I've been used to working on for a long time. They have this interesting concept, like you have a vendor, and they customize and say, well, I want these on. I don't want these on. I want this and that. On x86, it's here comes the CPU vendor. Here's the chip. Here's the chipsets, and hey, you manufacture of motherboards. You customize as you see fit, put your magic juice in it, but this is kind of the end product. You, 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 you will have the same thing. On ARM, it's different. People can cut off pieces, they can add pieces, and so forth. So it's a lot of different standards that we have to support, regardless of who is the manufacturer of the board. So it's kind of hard to say, well, like, yeah, this, this ARM CPU will have these things. No, it, it's this ARM and this other SOCs will, have, will work for you. Um, there are a lot of standards in it, and for some of you guys, you might glaze over and says, well, that's cool. Uh, that's really neat that it's there. You might want to look up the specs if you're really interested in it. Some of them are pretty good. Um, some of them are written by folks, I think, that have been in the legal department because my eyes were glazing over, but we'll see. Um, the other things that have been in development for it, oh, so let me go back one more slide. Um, super pages and IOMS support in UFI booting. Obviously, that means we have more larger support of hardware, and we can also do PCI pass-through. Well, no, not PCI, but P device assignments. And also expand to make larger guests be able to boot under Zen on ARM. Um, and as well, also improve how interrupts handling is done so that the guests are better, they have a low latency, they're faster, and so forth. All right. What all this means is if, you, if you're looking to buy an ARM motherboard and you look on Wiki and you say, I have this one, and you see some acronyms, you can look up on this page and say, OK, this is when it's going to be in. So just keep that in mind. There's a bunch of acronyms, um, and that's what they mean. The, some of them will not be in Zen 4.5. They'll kind of defer to the next version, but eventually they'll be, and some of them are quite compatible. 
All right, here is a little list of some of the things that will be, that Zen 4.5 will support of the new motherboards or new chipset or SOCs as you might call them. And um, that's, that's the goal. All right, enough about ARM. So the other side of this is x86. That's the server market, desktop, laptop, you name it. And there's uh, the HP interrupt fixes is a bit stale. That's actually postponed to Zen 4.6. But anyhow, point of some of this is, um, for example, this new thing came called UEFI and Secure Boot, and it's supposed to make everything much better and faster. It, it is, but there are pieces that are in it. There's a GRUB2. Well, no. You can make this happen in lots of variations and, comp and ways. So for example, with Zen 4.2 or 4.3, you could boot Zen under UEFI with Secure Boot, but you had to do customization. You, you can still do it, um, and there's ways to make it happen now, but there's no grub, there is no menu specifying, so you can boot Zen or Linux, you have to code it. One of the things that we wanted to do is make grub be able to support it, so you can load grub and it can load Zen and it will load Linux and so forth. That's kind of on the focus and it depends more on the external projects, such as grub2, which have a different schedule, so we might not hit it, but we might, it's unclear. VMware backdoor doors, this is pretty neat. You take a guest that runs on VMware, zoop, it runs under Zen. Zoop, you move it on VMware, Zen. The customer sees no difference. It's pretty fantastic. I'm looking forward to having it in Zen 4.5. Um, the other thing is, as I mentioned and alluded earlier, we have these mega huge machines. And we need some way to determine whether they're, when there are performance bottlenecks, when Zen is running multiple guests. And one of the things and tools we have found is Perf. This is a Linux tool. And it's excellent at kind of narrowing down, telling you, OK, this is where you have a bottleneck. So we've been working on making Perf work with Zen so that you can kind of get a whole trace of what the Zen hypervisor is doing, where it's sitting most of the time, or where DOM0 or the guest, or all three at once if you really want to spend a lot of time looking at beautiful pictures and lots of code, which I do. Lastly, uh, so one of our OPW interns has been focusing on VNUMA, which is also a part of large-scale machines. Is you have NUMA large machines, you need some way of making, allocating a guest and somehow passing that so applications can also take advantage of it. Some of the other features that I've been adding into it, and as you can see, I'm kind of running out of breath because there are so many things. Uh, there's the way of looking at guests and analyzing if it has a virus or malware in it and in another different domain, analyzing it and subverting it. So these are some of the things that have been expanded into the Zen hypervisor to, t to make that an availability. Um, the Bitdefender, who is our uh, dinner sponsor, is one of those companies that's focusing on that. Um, lastly, we were talking about PVH. One of the things we wanted to get for Zen 4.5 is we want to be able to boot a Linux guest, no, sorry, Linux DOM0 in PVH mode instead of PV. Um, for some of you who don't know what the distinction between PV and PVH is, it means less and faster. It's leaner, better Linux. I can go into more details at a buff or whatnot, but let's, let's defer to that one. And also make the virtual HPAD much better and less buggy. Ah, all right, the other thing is developers, we need server support. When we find bugs and we like to work on new platforms, we need a server support so we can type those commands and figure out where things are going wrong. So we have added, expanded that one. We have also added alternative assembler, which allows you on different CPUs to rewrite the hypervisor code so that if you're running on a newer model machine, you'll take advantage of these operations. And if you're not, well, then you won't. And, but you won't have an impact on the speed of performance of the hypervisor. You might see a trend here. I say performance every other slide. We really want to make sure the Zen 4.5 has performance in it. It has been having stable. It's having new features. It's been bug free. We also want to make sure that the performance of it is getting better and better and better. And the other thing, such as IORec, is an interesting feature where you can have multiple QMU or some variations of it for one guest. So you can kind of scale it out and, and make it make more QMU instances for certain guests that can handle different memory areas. And lastly, real-time schedule. I hope that's going to go in. And the one that's currently in Zen is a little bit old and doesn't work that well. And there has been two sets of patches that are kind of working on it. And we'll have, a, I hope, very much a Zen, a, in Zen 4.5, a real-time schedule. Also on the sides of Intel, uh, sorry, of vendors such as Intel and AMD, we have support for some of the new features that they're shipping in their chips. Um, the, you can kind of Google up what they mean. Um, I won't go into details. And also for the same thing for AMD side. So we have both new features to make a, uh, to take advantage of it.
All right, tool stack. That's the one level lower level than the hypervisor. And one of the neat things is the migration. So the Zen Server team at in Citrix recognized that the migration that we have between guests is, well, it's very messy code. It's hard to understand. And it has some really re weird race bugs in it. So um, they've been focusing on rewriting and making a migration that was new with a design document that's fantastically fast, much faster, 50%, I think, faster than the old one, easier to understand, all that. So that should go into Zen 4.5 as well. Remus, this is an interesting idea, which is checkpointing. You have a guest in Chicago, you have the same guest in Boston. Chicago suddenly has a horrible weather and the data center goes down, the guest resumes within 500 milliseconds in Boston and keeps on ticking. That's the idea behind Remus. So more patches are going into to make that available, uh, that work for, for uh, users. Uh, LibXL, they're continuing effort to make it work as Zen D has. So there are certain things that used to work in Zen, that, sorry, that are working in Zen D that we have not put in Excel and there's focus on getting that kind of parity. And lastly, systemd support. Uh, a lot of vendors are using systemd instead of scripts to boot up, so there's been work to make that happen as well. All right, um, these pretty much have been copied from Jim. Jim gave me a list of it, but these are work that Jim and Olaf and other people have been working on, and Libvirt has an interesting cycle. They go every month, they release, and they take advantage of what is new. So there's been a ton of things in it that have been taking advantage of and, and, adding, and adding more code to the Libvirt, which by the way is used by Vert Manager and Versh to drive a Zen installation. So there's been, they've just been constantly adding things, making it work, making it work, and um, it's, it's really fantastic. That gets us closer to having this, you get a Fedora, Ubuntu, and you can use any type of product to install your guests. You don't have to, you can use Excel, you can use Verse, you can use Vertmana, all of those, all that plumbing is there, and it works. All right, we also switch early on to using a QMU upstream. We have still have the traditional one, which is the old version of QMU we took and we modified, but now we're using the upstream one because there's so much goodness in it and we want to make sure we have it. So all the things that we need to have Zen working, we push upstream and then we take that version of QMU and push it in our product as we release it. And um, the neat things are, for example, um, PCI pass-through. There's, there's ongoing effort to make PCI pass-through work with Zen, uh, Zen, so you can kind of pass in an Intel NIC, uh, sorry, Intel uh, graphics card, and it all works. Um, if you have PCI devices, small ones, and you need a lot of them, you can kind of expand QMU to have more of it. And lastly, if you want to have UEFI, hey, you can boot it, and better yet, it has native support for a PV block and driver. So, uh, as, as George mentioned, for example, PV Grub 2, which is a Grub that can do PV, well, now we have in a BIOS, a UFI BIOS, a firmware, it can understand the Zen block protocol too. So it, it really is an interesting world now we live in. Um, and of course, we also use some uh, emulation of, or uh, not emulation, we use some of the backend drivers that QMU has for, to, to, to provide for Zen, Zen uh, images. All right, I'll skip all the Linux because that is what David Rebell would talk about. FreeBSD is also another user of Zen, and they're focusing on PVH. And the release is a much longer, it's a one year, and they're also going to add support, they already have support for PVH, they're gonna expand it to have PVH DOM0 support. So you, you don't have to have Linux to boot a Zen host, you can also use FreeBSD. Uh, it's really good stuff. I mean, you know, years ago, everybody was like, it's gotta be Linux, that was it. We had the problem that was only the patches to make Linux work with DOM0 were not in upstream. And now everything is kind of like, well, not only is it upstream, now you have choices. And, and choices are good. And also make MinIOS, which is used as subdomain, work on ARM. All right, the last part is the GRUB2. So um, one of our developers, uh, Daniel, has been working on making GRUB2 work with Zen or expanding a protocol so that it can work. So you can kind of have secure boot, GRUB2, loads Zen, Zen loads Linux, and all that works great. So, um, as you can see, that was a lot of things. Um, and some of these will get cut out because September 10th is the day, and that's when we make the decision, and if it doesn't get in, I'm sorry, but there's another train coming, and that's Zen 4.6, and by that time, 
things will go in as well, the things that haven't gone in. Our list of deferral does keep a little bit growing, but such is the nature of software development and priority. You've got to figure things out which are more important. Um, and I think this is going to be a fantastic release, and I'm really looking forward to it, people testing it, and be best yet, if you do test it, please send if it works or it doesn't work, and it really, it helps a lot to us. All right, questions? Wow, that means that, oh yes. <laughs> so uh, when's, uh, when's 4.6 coming out? Ah, <laughs> right, so December 10th is when we're going to release. Yeah. Everybody's going to go and relax in Hawaii during the Christmas break, <laughs> come back in January, refreshed. <laughs> That's right. January, I, I, I presume somewhere in the beginning of January, people are going to, okay, that we have our three months that we're going to focus on on stashing all these things that kind of got deferred to 4.6 and we've been busy bug fixing, now we can stash them in. Right. So you're basically saying maybe it's going to be a six-month cycle again. We'll see. I mean, that's going to be dependent on the next person who wears this fabulous jacket. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. You mentioned the, the VMware stuff? The VMware, yeah. VMware. So it's not make, it's it's you launch your own guest back on on a Zen cloud instead of a VMware cloud. So Don will be the one who could give you all the. Talk a little bit more, but it's not. It's not about live migration. It's not yeah no no it's not live migration but it is launching you it's kind of like a migrating a guest offline to without having to uninstall and install p drivers and so forth. Sorry for that confusion. Oh, okay, excellent. All right. So that's it from my side. And um, now I'm going to hand it off to David, who is one of the co maintainers of Linux in Zen Subsystem. Thank you very much, guys, and enjoy this, uh, enjoy this presentation. Thank you.